On today's World Insight, we speak to the president of the U.S. Semiconductor Industry Association. He explains why tariffs are bad for the U.S. chip industry. And trade policies are a key concern for the chambers of commerce in trading nations. Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce, John Denton, gets us up to speed. For People and Planet, a World Insight special on MC13, the WTO's 13th Ministerial Conference. I'm Tian Wei, here in Beijing. Currently, China remains the largest consumer of semiconductors, with semiconductors becoming the primary chips shaping the world of AI. Could China and the U.S. hurdle differences? On that and more, I had a conversation with the president and CEO of the U.S. Semiconductor Industry Association on the sideline of MC13. Many do not know why businesses are here in the middle of uh, the trade negotiations among ministers of trade from all over the world. Tell me more about your mission. We, 80% uh, of our customers are overseas, so all the market opening that the WTO has done, all the trade disciplines has put in place is really important for us. The other thing is, well, one of the big secrets to our success is that we have a kind of a breathtaking innovation, and which, is, which is driven by the fact we reinvest so much of our sales into R&D. The other important leg of this is that from the beginnings, we've been very, very, very tied into the global supply chains. Mm -hmm. And so having uh, the WTO there keeping free trade in place and making it stronger has been absolutely critical for us. Mm -hmm. More specifically, mm -hmm. this time we're here, we're very concerned about uh, some of this loose talk about not extending the e-commerce moratorium. Well, a lot of our designs, which are super complex, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our software, a lot of our process data is constantly moving around the world in the supply chains. and contemplating that somehow getting hit with tariffs yeah. is, is pretty rough for us. And it would be a real, real cooling um, uh, chill effect mm. on our ability to do business around the world. On the e-commerce moratorium, actually there are a lot of countries that are supporting to go to the extension of that. But there are different voices. Yeah. How do you see from an industry association's perspective of the role of WTO in this regard, the nature of discussion? What yeah. do you think is the nature of discussion regarding this? First of all, just from a high level, um, we would find it a stunning defeat for the WTO, which is all about kind of making trade easier to somehow reverse course and make trade more difficult mm -hmm. with uh, not continuing with, with, the, uh, with the moratorium. Second of all, you know, um, the e-commerce moratorium is good for big companies, it's good for small companies, it's good for developed economies, right. it's good for developing economies. In fact, um, this group of, of African, um, Caribbean, and Pacific countries, almost 80, have a proposal that includes support for continuing the e-commerce moratorium. We're very excited about that, encouraged about, about that. We hope that this thing gets across the finish line um, I, uh, in a successful way. I, I strongly feel that uh, this uh, ministerial can't conclude with successfully without the moratorium extended. Some of my colleagues uh, were in a, in a, in a meeting uh, in Chinese Taipei of the World Semiconductor Council, and that includes SIAs from U.S., from Japan, from Chinese Taipei, from Europe, from Korea, and from China. Mm -hmm. So CSIA and all these other associations signed a letter to uh, Prime Minister Modi and Indian Trade Minister Goyal saying we need to continue this moratorium. So that just shows how serious we are in advancing this. And the WSC itself, the World Semiconductor Council, is just 
really unique and wonderful um, constellation of semiconductor associations mm. that has been coming together for decades now uh, to try to solve mutual problems. Mm. We see a lot of populism uh, in the world and sometimes policymakers make use of the excuse of populism um, and the excuse of slogans. How do you see these kind of things are being taken advantage? My view on this, this is um, kind of short-term gains which are limited versus long-term gains which are massive. And uh, if you put um, tariffs on cross-border data flows, well, you capture some revenue in the short term, but in the long term, you make it harder for these, these incredible products and bits of data to get to consumers' hands and to allow them to use them to, to uh, uh, create growth across the economy. We, we worked very hard 10 years ago, and China was actually a, a partner in this effort to expand the Information Technology Agreement, which is the hard good side of tech. And we ran into the same problem. We ran into countries, particularly smaller countries, that were very focused on the short term and worried about revenue loss from giving up tariffs and not thinking about, well, wait a minute, we get all these high-tech products in our economy that is going to help us grow the economy in healthcare and financial services. For the long term, obviously much bigger benefits, harder to measure, and in the short term, you can actually measure, measure the foregone tariffs. So that's, the, I, I think, the key tension here is, are you thinking short term or are you thinking long term? Mm. The other thing about your industry is uh, we see the industrial policies that different countries are putting on the sector. It is one of the most crucial. Mm -hmm. uh, you could say for future cooperation, you could also say for future competition. What is the picture of industrial policy in your sector? Yeah. How do you see that? You know, for, for a long, long time, our federal government wasn't in the game of offering incentives. And as a result, our chip manufacturing moved offshore quite substantially in the last 30 years. And now roughly 75% of all chip manufacturing is happy in, in East Asia. Mm -hmm. That's an overconcentration. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what the Chips and Science Act is aimed to do is not bring everything back, not even near everything, but bring it back more to make us less, less vulnerable if there's some kind of seismic disturbance, some, some kind of uh, uh, another pandemic so that we're a little bit m more secure. And, you know, we live in an imperfect world yeah. and countries have been offering subsidies for years and years and years in our sector, targeted subsidies, and our government has not. At least now we're in the race, the, the playing field is more level, and we feel that um, as, as an industry that, that this was very necessary. Mm. You suggested, sir, that um, you are not there to occupy the market or to dominate the market, quote unquote, um, but rather to a degree uh, that to what you just explained. But that is a very interesting and intricate balance to take. If you look at what ha what's happened to our industry, in 1990, 37% of the world's semiconductors were produced, manufactured on U.S. shores. Mm -hmm. Now it's down to 10%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what's, what's the perfect number? Well, we got to stop the decline. We got to turn the corner and start coming back up. And that's, that's what the Chips and Science Act is going to help do. And already we have over $200 billion in private sector commitments mm -hmm. to build more facilities on U.S. shores. Mm -hmm. This is not about bringing everything back. It's about taking some vulnerability out of the system. Mm -hmm. It's about spreading the risk out uh, more, more for, uh, across more ge geographies. And, you know, the, the pandemic kind of, uh, it got everyone understanding what chips were, but it, it also got us thinking about where our, our vulnerabilities were. And it was, it got people understanding that, you know, it, in, at least in manufacturing, there's too much over-concentration of manufacturing in East Asia. Mm. On the one hand, almost all national governments now understand the importance of chips, semiconductors, and they want to put incentives or encouraging measures or whatever you say, uh, whatever you term it. 
uh, to the industry in their own countries. So that might be a pro for the industry. But on the other hand, the complexity of geopolitics related to this also put your industry so much torn in so many different places in the world. And thinking about a global company that have to handle this, how do you see these uh, quite mixed up circumstances? Most solutions are imperfect mm -hmm. and we're not gonna get the balance perfect, but I think we're gonna get in a better place than we were. The fact that we're having uh, so many of our companies um, making commitments to get more manufacturing on U.S. shores, again, but our companies are also making commitments to put manufacturing in Germany, to put manufacturing in Singapore, mm -hmm. different places around the world. And it's again, if you just look at it, it's spreading the risk out. The other thing is about the latest technologies. It's taking place as a, as a lightning speed, if I could use that analogy, yeah, especially. Yeah, probably faster than that. And therefore, what does this industry mean? I mean, your sector. We did, in a very productive way, was expanding the um, the information technology agreement. And that's, that's eliminating tariffs on a whole range of, of tech products. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that successfully uh, in 2015. It was about a four or five year negotiation. Mm -hmm. China was a big part of that. Uh, sometimes there was some tough discussions, but at the end of the day, we all came together and we figured this out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was the kind of first and only market access market expansion agreement that the WTO was able to successfully do mm -hmm. since it was founded. Mm -hmm. And we did it with, with the ITA. And it, 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 with our industry, there's, there's just, as you mentioned, there's just lightning speed, innovation, all sorts of new products. And so that was almost 10 years ago. It's time to do it again. We have all sorts of new products coming, you know, coming online. Last time we, we included all sorts of medical devices, mm -hmm. life-saving medical devices, and there's all sorts of other things we can put in an ITA3. Mm -hmm. So we would like to make the next step to recognize the innovation in our in our industry mm -hmm. and do an ITA3. And mm -hmm. and so I think the days of these big singular undertakings in the WTO are over. We have to do plurilateral agreements. We have to take smaller bites of the apple. And I do think that one of the things the WTO needs to do, focus on things it can get done, show value to the members so that when the members are talking to people, decision makers in their capitals, that they can show the value proposition of the, of the WTO. So I think an ITA3 would be a, a really important step forward. Mm. Also about your industry is the amount of uh, um, manufacturing capacity that's actually needed in order to uh, support all these Great kind of question. latest innovation. Yeah. Yeah. So I really want to know how you are looking at the potential, you know, how, what are you researching about in order to understand the potential? You know, one thing that we look at a lot in our industry is projections for growth. Yeah. And um, there's a lot of projections out, out there saying that our industry, which is, I don't know, 560, 570, billion today will grow to uh, one trillion by 2030. Mm -hmm. Driven by AI, driven by Internet of Things, driven by 6G, mm -hmm. uh, driven by the automotive sector, electric, electric vehicles which have thousands and thousands of chips in them. Mm -hmm. So we know we're on a kind of a almost a hockey stick slope up in terms of our growth, <clears throat> but it takes two to four years to get manufacturing capacity in place. And that's why you're seeing such a flurry of activity among the chip industry leadership to figure out where to put that capacity so that we can get the shovels in the ground and get the production in place to meet the, the mountain of demand, uh, of demand coming our way. Do you see there's enough diversity of companies that are doing that? You know, there's been a lot of consolidation in our, in our industry. And the reason for that is that um, to survive in our industry, you need scale. You need to be big, uh, particularly when it comes to the high end, Indeed. the chips. And that's why the most high end chips are only produced in, produced in a, few, a few countries, mm -hmm. a few economies. And, um, and I doubt that is gonna change. But there are analog chips, the chips that uh, 
turn the, the analog, the, the real world, into the digital world, lots of sensors on cars. Right. The, the price of entry for those is a lot cheaper. It's not 10 or $20 billion for a fab. It's one to three to five billion dollars. Mm -hmm. So there's kind of more opportunities for those kinds of fabs to be spread more widely, not right. just among like the three or four economies. Mm -hmm. And and so um, so that that's that's all underway right now. And mm -hmm. and um, we're we're in a massive kind of build phase. And I suspect once we get through this massive build phase, we'll move into another one. We see so many creative ideas as to where to look for the energy that's needed uh, from entrepreneurs, from the civil society. Yeah, but, yeah. but John, I mean, as someone who is working with the industry, what are some of the you know, things that you are looking at so closely? We are very much seeking out locations now that uh, can provide more uh, renewable energy. And the, the other big challenge that we're all facing, in, including China, is workforce. Mm. Uh, we just we have a lot, we all have a lot of STEM talent, mm -hmm. but we don't have enough STEM talent that is trained in the semiconductor industry. That's a special kind of training, mm -hmm. and so we're all confronting that challenge. In fact, um, you know the D Chips Act is kind of a a, a a big roll of the dice for the U.S. government. It's a kind of have, has, has not done something like this mm -hmm. for a long time, um, maybe not quite never, um, and. Um, we're going to have to, if we're going to be successful, we're going to have to get our arms around this talent, talent question. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's, it's a couple of things. One is building more indigenous talent, and the other is uh, immigration reform. I must mm -hmm. say, immigration reform in the U.S. is a very fraught mm -hmm. uh, political exercise. So um, we're, we're very focused on building the, a bigger pipeline for the STEM talent. On the one hand, you see China and the U.S. and other players here in WTO working together on the e-commerce issue with very much a big common ground. On the other hand, from the industry uh, competitions perspective, you see uh, Chinese companies trying to come up with their own versions of the chips that might be used for the country and their own industry while they're having lack of access to some of the most advanced chips. So how do you see these different, you know, uh, so, pictures all going on at the same time. So a couple of things. Um, we're very um, pleased that there's more dialogues going on between the two countries. Mm -hmm. If countries aren't talking to each other, that's just n not not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And and what we would like to see is, um, uh, as I said with the WTO yeah. on small bites of the apple. Mm -hmm. Let's see if there's some areas where there can be small bites of the apple where we can make some, some common good progress, common cause progress, and, and see where we go from there. That's my exclusive interview with President and CEO of the U.S. Semiconductor Industry Association. And you're watching World Inside, our special program, Trade for People and Planet.